nycdistancelearning.org. And you'll get all this information in your follow-up email too. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so grant writing for schools. Let's get into it. Next slide, please. All right, so when you are ready to write a grant, you're gonna kind of go through a few steps in order to prepare yourselves and make sure that you know what you're asking for and how to ask for it. So the first step to any grant writing process would be to have a visioning meeting with yourself and the other stakeholders. So if you're working on an outdoor classroom or a school garden for your school, you're gonna to wanna to have teachers, parents, uh, school administration like principals or vice principals, as well as custodians, everyone who's gonna be involved in this project, you want them to have a voice in the vision. So you're gonna have, sometimes it takes more than one visioning meeting uh, in order to figure out what it is that you want to create at your school. Once you have this big vision and you've spent time thinking, dreaming kind of big, you're gonna kind of nail down all the details. So you're gonna have to come up with your plan and the design of your project. Once you have that, you're gonna wanna have a pretty detailed timeline and you're gonna wanna do a lot of research to figure out exactly how much it's all gonna cost. Then when you have all that information, you'll be ready to actually sit down and write the grant, answer the questions and submit it. So we're gonna go through um, some of all these steps in a little more detail. Next slide. Uh, I did want to point out the grants that are open right now that schools can apply for. This is the list taken straight from the monthly newsletter that I send out. So all of these are grants that me and other people from the School Gardens team, we've researched and found these ones are open and we put the deadlines and we hyperlink to them so that you could click on each of these when you get the newsletter and read more information about them. So as you can see, there are quite a lot of them open right now. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And I just wanted to uh, show you how you might sift through such a big list like this. If they're all, each of these grants is gonna be like giving you something different, gonna have a different process and different like prize. So the first one up there is from Kids Gardening, which is a national school gardens nonprofit. So the one for this um, that, that has a deadline tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, they have $1,200 in cash so pretty small, like we would consider that a mini grant. And they're only choosing 15 schools nationwide who are gonna win this grant. So if you're trying to consider if something is worth your time to like sit down and, and get done by tomorrow, this one I would recommend for most of you, it's not gonna be worth it because it's gonna be a whole application you have to submit really soon. It's not a ton of money and the pool is huge, the applicant pool. The next one that you see highlighted here is the DOE Sustainability Project Grant. And that's the one that Thad from the DOE is gonna be here and he's gonna answer some specific questions about that. So this one is probably gonna be a lot more worth your while. The top prize, as far as I, I, I didn't look into it super in depth, so Thad might have more details about it, but the, the highest you could be awarded is $5,000. And the applicants are any New York City public schools I believe charter schools are not included um, in this grant when I was reading about it online. If they, I think if it's DOE, it is. Um, but you could, that's a great question for we that. Should answer that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so those and are the kind of details you definitely want to figure out. Not highlighted on here is the School Wellness Council grant that's due next mm -hmm. month, that's due on Monday. Um, if I would I would prioritize these two. I would prioritize anything this year that the DOE is specifically offering because a lot of these national grants mean that you are up against everybody nationally who could be applying. So you're up against schools in California, you're up against schools in the Midwest, you're up against schools all along the East Coast. Whereas if you apply for the School Wellness Council grant or you apply for the Office of Sustainability's grant, you are only up against New York City schools. So. Anything yeah. that narrows the, the playing field is definitely a good one for this year. Yeah, and that's not to say that it's, if it's New York City schools, it's, it's not gonna be like a competitive right. um, applicant pool because there are almost 2000 
New York City school sites. So you're still going to want to stand out and have a really well planned grant. Um, so another one to look out that, that I just kind of highlighted just to show you how to sift through the list. We've got Youth Garden Grant, which is also from that national nonprofit Kids Gardening. And so something to note about that one is you're not actually getting a very big cash prize. The highest you can get is $250 and the rest is just materials that they get from their funders. So you'll get like garden gloves and seeds and shovels and things from Burpee because that's one of their funders. Um, so it's up to you if that's worthwhile for you or not. Another one that I pointed out is IOB crowdfund matching and if you sign up for the newsletter, which hopefully you all will sign up for the newsletter, you'll see this IOB on there pretty much every single month. Um, so they're not necessarily like a grant where you apply for something and they give you money. They're a crowdfund matching. So on their website, you create a profile for your school and you put about your project. So it, it's kind of like GoFundMe and you have people donate to it and then IOB will match those funds. And there is a process to apply with them to make sure that they actually will match the funds. Um, so that's what, they have two programs where they'll match school garden type projects or other community greening projects. Um, and IOB, we like to put them on our list because they're a Brooklyn based nonprofit. So they're local, they're hyper-focused on New York City projects. And so having that local pool is gonna give you a much better chance um, than like the big nationwide ones. They also, you know, if anyone's familiar with crowdfunding, all crowdfunding platforms take a cut. They take a percentage of the amount of money that you raise. That's how they, that's how they operate. Um, IOB takes a much smaller cut than a lot of those other crowdfunding platforms. So yeah. if you are considering it, and I know it's not for everybody, uh, it's a good platform to look into, especially because they have matching grants for uh, matching component to different na for, uh, for specific neighborhoods. <laughs> yes. All right. We can, you're going to want to take time and like go through this list at some point, um, but we'll email you just this specific list so you can click through each and every one of these grants um, and see which ones you actually want to spend the time on. All right. Next slide. Oof, COVID. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the slide that uh, we had to add in for this year's grant writing workshop because um, we do, I think everyone knows that the grant climate is much different this year. A lot of nonprofits don't have as much money to give as they did in the past. So when uh, like a first example is usually our program, Grow NYC School Gardens would be able to offer a once a year grant, mini grant, and this year we're not able to do it because of budget cuts. Um, which we're pretty disappointed about. <laughs> yeah, budget cuts and lost funding. So, um, you know, the, I, I see there's there's a question, somebody asked a question about nonprofits being able to apply for some of these grants. Um, maybe, maybe not, you'd have to check the parameters there, but as a lot of nonprofits are in that same boat, they are also fundraising and trying to write as many grants as possible. And so we, we love to, the grant has been, such a big part of our programming for the past 10 years. And we're really disappointed that we're not able to do it this year because we know so many of you rely on it, but we are hoping that we'll be able to bring it back next year. But in the meantime, like we're doing <laughs> this workshop today, we're gonna help you find as many other grant opportunities as you can. We were really happy to see that there's, there's more out there than I think we would have anticipated going into this year, knowing the state that a lot of nonprofits and um, organizations that have done grant funding in the past are in. So they're there and that list is a partial list. Laura has a longer list that's gonna go out to everybody later and that's updated very regularly. So as we find them, grant opportunities, we make them available to you. The newsletter is a great way to find them. Also there's this um, Google doc sheet that we'll send to you that has that that's updated. Um, but like Laura was saying, it's really competitive this year because the pools of money, even for the organizations that are able to continue offering, it doesn't mean that they have as much money to offer or that they are um, 
funding like as high as they used to. So like we've seen that maybe historically they've done like a grant that capped out at maybe $2,000 this year, maybe it's only a thousand dollars maximum. So it's changed. It's definitely changing. Um, and it means that anything you apply, anything you do, if you're going to spend the time to do it in the first place, you have to do it very competitively. Yes. And, um, so our biggest tip, and this might be one of like the main takeaways from like the workshop today is for this year, especially with COVID, when you're writing your grants, the biggest tip is to show a funder how you are responding to COVID and how this project will benefit you both during your school community during COVID and afterwards in the long term. So you want to show them how you're going to pivot if school closes. Um, or how the materials that you need right now in the short term to create an outdoor classroom to reduce the spread of, you know, possible coronavirus, um, how that outdoor classroom will actually be built and be used for years and years to come even afterwards. Um, and as part of a longer term vision. So some pivot ideas we've seen some of our schools even do with the grant that they got from us last year is that they, when school closed, they mailed home gardening kits to their students at home. So little pack of seeds, a little bag of coconut choir or seed starting mix, and then told them like to find something in their recycling bin to grow it in. So that's those mail home gardening kits that shows that students are still engaging and receiving benefits of growing and greening um, even during like school closure sites. Very important. Yes. Um, you have to show how you can pivot and what the long-term plan is. I'm just reiterating because this is so key. Yeah. And you can't put in a grant. Well, if school closes, we'll just, I don't know, we'll do it when it, that doesn't work. Like it we'll needs to save it for later. <laughs> that's right. There needs to, to be that. plan A, school stays open, you're doing X, Y, and Z. It's part of a longer-term vision for the school. Plan B, school closes, but you can still fulfill what you're what you're trying to do in the grant. And that's gonna make your grant a lot more competitive. Yeah, another example I, I just remembered from one of our school gardens as well is uh, at the, at the co-op tech uh, in Upper Manhattan, they have a greenhouse for their school garden. And so when school sites were closed, the, the teacher who was in charge of it, she was able to still have access to that greenhouse and um, created like a virtual greenhouse garden that she could keep the students updated on. And that became a really important source of connection and education for them. So there's all these, these ways to be creative and show that you're able to pivot and that you're flexible and adaptable. All right, let's go on to the next section, which is grant writing do's and don'ts. So let's get into that. So this first one is kind of, you, you probably know this already since many of you are educators and teachers, but follow the instructions very <laughs> carefully, read the directions. You always wanna make um, a draft of your grant answers on your own computer on a Word doc or a Google doc. Even if the grant platform says like, we'll save it for you, we'll save it for later. There's so many glitches that so many things can go wrong with that. So copy all the questions, put it into a, a Google doc that way you can work on it, save your work, and it's easy for you to share with other people from the school um, so that you can collaborate. It doesn't all fall on one person's shoulders. And make sure you answer all parts of the questions. We, like, I know Kristen, whenever she writes grants, she'll actually put bullet points for answers to make sure that she's hit every single point. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the silliest reason to be disqualified is not following the instructions. And <laughs> yeah. I, I know it feels like the most intuitive and the most obvious, but it's also what trips people up the most. So yeah. make sure you understand them, know what they are going in. Um, we had a, a teacher once, I mean, a lovely person, but she called to say that she was writing the grant for us. Something happened to her computer. She lost the work. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can really do about that, you know, so, um, so just back it up, make life easier. Um. Yep. Um, and this is also um, good to, for making sure you answered all parts of the question and having it on a, a Google Doc that saves automatically, is you can have someone else from your school community proofread it for you and make sure. So that's kind of nice to have different, we'll get into like the different roles that people can have on your garden committee. Um, 
but there might be someone who actually does have enough time to write the grant and someone else who doesn't can't make such a big time commitment, but maybe they could proofread it. And that can make the difference between it being a good grant into a great one. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, this is gonna be very relevant as well for this year is making sure that your project fits what the funder is asking for and what their focus is. Um, since it's gonna be competitive this year and the funds are not flowing as freely as in the past, uh, you wanna make sure that what you're asking for it matches exactly what they're asking, they, they wanna see in the grant. So for example, if it's a garden grant and they want to see projects that increase access to green space, that's great. Don't ask for bees, right? Like don't ask for beehives in that. Cause even though it feels like a garden thing, it's not achieving the funder's goal of like, inc they might want a straight up square footage number that they can, they can turn around with at the end and say, we funded 60 projects that made 200,000 square feet of green space, right? So like your beehive doesn't fit into that story that they are, or that, that project that they're trying to fulfill on. So if it doesn't fit, don't ask for it. Ask, like write your grant so that it fits what the funders ask is. Exactly. All right, next, we wanted to stress the importance of having a personal connection with the funder. And I mentioned that a little bit, that's why those local grants, the New York City based grants and nonprofits within the city, you'll have a better chance with them. Um, that's not gonna be possible with every single grant, but it does make a big difference. I know for our own organization, if we know the backstory and we know the person, we know that they're putting in the work, um, that can make a difference in, in terms of how we rate their grant application. Yeah. Um, and that's gonna be nice, like today Thad from the DOE is coming in so you can talk to him um, or at least chat with him through the Q&A and stuff. Yeah. Um, you can also email if you have a specific question about something, but we do wanna stress that you not wait until the day or the week that it's due because that's mm -hmm. gonna reflect poorly on you. So you wanna reach out well in advance in advance and make believe that talking to the funder is part of the, it's like an interview, right? Um, you want to put your best forward there too, your best foot forward there as well. Yeah. Okay. Next, Next. We, um, I, we recommend if you have your garden committee um, to appoint someone or ask someone to be a grant specialist. And this doesn't have to be someone who actually has that as their profession or it's something that they're trained in or anything. It's basically just someone who is okay with writing, um, who has, you know, acts, knows how to use online platforms and things like that. Uh, and who can just keep track of all these different grants that are coming out. And then they can actually reuse a lot of the same answers that they used on other grants. Just make sure that, you know, make a few changes to make sure it fits each one. But that'll save you a lot of time. Um, yeah. This person, you know, writing the grant and getting the grant is like phase one, right? But this person can also help you track the grants that you've applied to, who you've heard from, who you haven't, so that you know if, if you need to maybe send a little follow-up. Mm -hmm. But also, if you are to get these grants, which is great, and I hope you all do, um, there's, there's reporting and there's follow-up that needs to happen as well. And so having like one very organized person or team of organized people who can help you figure out, you know, when there's a six month report, there's a one year report, there's check-ins, like each grant requires different things as far as the follow-up goes. So having somebody to help track that as well as look for other opportunities is very much recommended. Yeah, and a lot of times what we'll see is with a garden, school garden or, or project like this, um, it'll be one extremely passionate person, you know, involved with the school and they're the head of the garden committee, they're doing all the planting, the watering, caretaking over the summer, a million things on top yeah. of their normal job. Too much. They track of the grants and writing them as well is like too much for one person. And I think this year that's especially important because everyone is overextended in different ways um, to just make sure that we're spreading the load. Yeah. 
All right, next up, kind of related, is to save your documentation. Again, it's just a time saver and an energy saver. You don't want to start from scratch every single year. All right, next one is getting a little more into when you're actually like responding to the questions in there. And this can be part of your visioning meetings as well, is making sure that you're using a communal voice with your grant and you're proposing a project that is gonna have a widespread benefit for a lot of different people in the school. Um, so you wanna use, we want to build this. We think this will be like a wonderful project for all of our students, as well as our parents, teachers, and you know everyone involved in the school community. Um, you wanna see that the entire community is benefiting and invested in this, uh, not just like one person's passion project. Right, you know, I think the the more you can define the need. So our need, our school community has no access to green space. This garden would, whatever, produce X amount of green space for students. This many students will be served. Parents will be able to use the space. How you know? However, this is all your vision, right? The the clearer picture you can paint of how many people in your school community are going to be able to use this and how it's filling a need, the better. Uh, you do also want to keep in mind, how are you standing out from other projects? Um, I think it's kind of hard because you think every single school garden project is like a beautiful thing. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're, you're showing that you're really, you have a concrete plan, um, that you have a lot of people uh, to rally behind this project. And so you don't want to underestimate the applicant pool. Um, here in New York City alone, there's over 1,800 schools that could potentially be applying. Yeah. Next, this <laughs> is another one of those like huge takeaways from this workshop. Please, please, please make an extremely detailed budget. This can be like, you can have all the passion and like the, the most amazing idea and project that will benefit people so well. And this has happened to us reading grants. We're like, this project sounds amazing and beautiful, but we don't have any, their budget makes no sense. We can't just like give thousands of dollars to, to someone who has not illustrated clearly what they're gonna do with those thousands of dollars. So you need to make sure that your budget has, um, in the next slide, I'll show you the itemized uh, way to like make a budget. Always use a spreadsheet or a table. Um, I think that's pretty universal for, for most grants these days. Uh, and so you're, you're going to have like, you can go to the next slide, actually, Kristen. I want to point out what not to do before yeah. we show them the good okay, thing. Sure. Like, yeah. Let's say that you write this gorgeous grant, and then when it gets to the budget, all you put is, you know, the maximum amount of the grant is $2,000, and you put greenhouse, $2,000, right? But like, no information on the make and model of the greenhouse, whether or not that includes shipping, what vendor you are purchasing that from. Um, does that include all the hardware and the extra stuff you're going to need to set up? The, so just greenhouse, $2,000, eh, game over, right? Yeah. And I don't remember if this comes later, so sorry if it does. If you find a greenhouse that you really, I'm just using, you could be whatever, right? The greenhouse costs $5,000. The grant max is 2000. Where do the other three come from? You know, that you need to, ins if, if there's a plan to raise that money from elsewhere and that's in the works, great. If the, and you need to explain that in your budget. Sometimes they'll ask for a budget narrative, which means that gives you the opportunity to explain what you're asking for. Um, so be specific. And also, you know, if the, if the grants capped at 2000, try to get to that 2000. Don't get creative here. This is a great budget. <laughs> um, this is great. Laura, you can walk them through this. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is like an example for if your school wants to build two raised beds and then have um, tents to, to host one or two classes outside for an outdoor classroom. So what you can see here is, well, we're gonna be building our own beds like that's great because it saves a lot of money so you'll have more money for other things if you're building stuff yourself um so we what i did to make this budget is i i looked up how many what are the dimensions of my beds so how much lumber will i need 
uh, I went on to Home Depot or Lowe's. They have a garden bed calculator. You can just Google garden bed calculator and put in your dimensions. It'll tell you how much lumber you're gonna need and how many like cubic feet of soil or compost. So you do wanna calculate that stuff. Um, and it's really useful because the people who you're sending these, submitting these grants to, they're familiar with how much things cost. So if you're saying that you need $5,000 for soil to fill up two beds, like they're gonna know that that's not a detail, that, that you don't know how much it really costs. 100%. Yeah, so um, whenever I make a budget, I, uh, I Google how much each item costs and you have an itemized list. Uh, and then you can see we also put in delivery costs so that we could actually get these materials to a potential school. And I know this probably sounds like slightly tedious to some of you today, but I can't tell you how many times we have seen people not do this and just be super vague. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't stress the importance of it. This shows that you are organized. There really is a plan behind it. It inspires confidence that if, if you are given a check, you will put it to good use. So yeah. take your time on this. I'll also, I'll point out one other thing. If you look in the cost column that you, I added everything up and I put it, how much it costs. Um, we've also gotten grants in the past where people put the cost of things they would put this and then for total funding request, they'll put $2,000 or something. Right. Or like, what are you using the other $1,000 for? So you wanna make sure you're adding and asking for what you have on your budget. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> and this is kind of uh, related to the budget, but just research before asking for things because your funders will know how much something is gonna cost more or less. So you don't wanna just stop at the brainstorming stage, make sure you know how you know, the details and how you're going to execute everything. So like Kristen said, if you ask for a greenhouse, make sure you know the dimensions of the greenhouse and how much it costs. Um, do you ha know how to install it or are you going to need to bring in an expert to help you install it? Are you planning on heating that greenhouse? Um, if you're getting a rain barrel, do you know how to hook up a rain barrel and collect rainwater, you're just going to leave it sitting in a schoolyard. So those are kinds of things. If you add those types of details, it'll make your grant much more strong. And also, you know, the, I think the don't here is really important. Don't stop at the brainstorming stage. You know, yeah. you might write this grant, you may actually get this money, which means you have to do <laughs> the thing that you have outlined in here. So the more that you can think through the steps to like, you know, making this a reality and pretending that you have that money in hand and really figuring out the, the execution plan, the better you'll be if, when you present this to the funder. And then if you do get that money, the better you'll be to actually execute it when the time comes. So, yes. cause don't forget, you don't have five years to pull this off. Like if you have a grant, you have the term of the grant to pull this off. So if that money comes through for you, say November one, you probably have a year to, to see it through or until the end of the school year. So you have to make sure that you can do this plan within that time frame. Yes. All right, moving on. Uh, oh, oh my goodness. We can talk <laughs> about this one all day. Can I do this one, Laura? Yes, go right. for it. So I have had three years of reading grants that people have put in. Grants that have said things like, we got a grant from you two years ago. We used it to buy plants. I don't know. Every single plant died. So we're asking for more money to replace them. Why would I fund you again? if there's no demonstration of knowledge about why the plants died in the first place, like, you know, these, these, especially this year when money is really tight for a lot of organizations who are making this, it's okay if you have made a mistake in the past, if you can identify it and show what you have learned from it and inspire confidence that that same mistake that tripped you up in the first place is not going to trip you up again going forward. So please, 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 like, <laughs> please make your case for why you deserve to have this funding again and how you will not repeat whatever mistake happened the first time. Uh, better yet, maybe don't even mention it if it doesn't have to be in there, right? So yeah. like, unless, you, you know, it's okay. If you, it's okay if you make a mistake, but you need to inspire confidence that you're in a different position this time around, so. And 
maybe another way to say this besides mistakes is also obstacles. So a lot of times the reasons that a school garden project didn't work out one year, it's totally out of your control. It's something like they didn't get enough light because they put up construction scaffolding without telling us and we didn't, we couldn't move it. But now we have a space that is sunny that we're going to like do this in. That's it. So you the can scaffold- how you overcame obstacles as well. The scaffolding is down. We are good to go, you know, so that's, and, and, and also I would say don't apply if you know that there is an obstacle that's going to prevent you from doing said thing. Like scaffolding is a perfect example. If you have scaffolding up at your school and you're not going to be able to do a garden until that scaffolding comes down, whatever date they told you the scaffolding is coming down, assume that it's going to go longer than that too. So, you know, if your project is contingent on something else happening first, you may want to wait um, to apply for funds until you are closer to that, that end date when you'll be able to pick this project up again. Okay, moving on, because I know we've got some questions and fads coming. So trying to move this along. Um, Anything that it is asking for, provide it, and then some. So if they give you the space to put pictures and success stories, I think that some grants are given purely based on the pictures because you have to think, right? If you're giving your application full of words, 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 words to a funder and they've now read 100 applications, 200 applications, and there's a page at the back where they can flip through and like see your work in action, like that picture speaks a lot more than all the rest of the words in that application. So um, do your reporting. Do all of your follow-up documentation. Do not reapply for a grant with the same funder if you did not fulfill your reporting requirements with them. Again, they not only, they're making a sustained investment in you, which means they're giving you this money upfront. They are trusting that you are gonna do what you said you were gonna do. The reporting, whether it's six months, one year, whatever it is that they want, that proves to them that you are doing this. So you have to, Um, You have to do that. Or when you go to reapply, they are going to look back to see if you did that reporting. And if you didn't, then there's a good chance they won't even consider your application going forward. So whether that's the grant person that you designate to this, who's tracking um, when these things are due, please do this. Um, It's a, it's a primary reason why schools don't receive funding again. So, all right, next up. Oh, a timeline. Yeah. And this is the last (laughs) slide that we actually have um, about grant writing. And so we've we've kind of stressed in almost like a stern parent voice, like these are the (laughs) takeaways, make sure you're adaptable to COVID, have the most detailed budget as possible. And then a timeline is another piece of the puzzle that will make your grant very strong if you can pinpoint, you know, when things are getting done and what is getting done. So here, uh, you're just gonna go month by month or season by season and say exactly what's happening, how it's gonna be done. And this shows that you have a clear plan to execute your project. Exactly, because if you find out that you have this money, that means you need to pick this plan up. You don't wanna find out you have it and then build this plan backwards. You wanna be able to start as soon as you know you have money in hand. So spending some time on this is definitely a good thing. Um, We had a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Did you want to go to questions? Yeah, we've got two that have that have been in this Q and A right here. So I wanted to make sure um, somebody is asking: Can schools partner with nonprofits to apply for these grants? Okay. Yes and no. Um, some of these grants are only going to be available to schools, so they would not be willing to necessarily like you couldn't use any of those funds to like to pay like a nonprofit partner's work in this. In the flip, if let's say a school wanted to, let's say the nonprofit partner wanted to apply and write a grant that like looped in specifically a couple of schools, that works. Um, When THAD comes on in a little bit, the Office of Sustainability's grant can be used by partner organizations. So there's a way that partners can actually apply to work with specific schools or that, oh, I'm sorry, schools can apply to work with specific partners. And I think you can use the maximum um, $5,000 
towards your community partner, your nonprofit with that. So that's a good bad question if you're interested. Um, I hope that answers your that question. Um, yes, we will resend the link with the available grants. 100%, you're going to yeah. get that after. And then there's a question in here about the importance of building a relationship. Where can I locate the contact information of the funders? Okay, note on that. Sometimes they will make it available, right? Like they'll have a way that you can ask some questions. Sometimes they will not make it available, in which case I, I, I wouldn't really track them down because maybe that's a sign that they, they don't want you to. Um, but like in a situation like the Office of School Wellness or the Office of Sustainability, where you got like usually almost always with grants, there's some kind of session like this where people can ask questions and they can, they'll present on like what the rules and requirements are for the grant, follow up with the people who are leading that workshop. In this case, we're not offering a grant, so it doesn't super help you to do that with us today, but like in Thad's case, yes, like then he gets to know you, um, he can find it. So I would say they'll either make it available on their website, usually with the grant, that's one way, Two is that there's usually an info session led by core members of the team. Usually they are also the ones that are making decisions on the grant. So that's a way to follow up. Um, or three, if it's like an organization that's offering it, you can always reach out to the organization or better yet, you can go to some of their other workshops and programs um, that shows that you're like invested in what they, what they offer and you're benefiting from the other things that are not grants. So that's another good way to make those connections. Um, so I hope that answers your question there. Uh, we have another question here that says, if I'm a CBO, can I apply in combination with my host school? Usually, yes. Um, it depends on the rules of the grant. Sometimes the grant will just want the school to apply. In that case, the school can apply on your behalf. Um, CBOs, sometimes that means you have written the grant, which is fine, but it has to be submitted by, <laughs> by the school. So, um, you know, if you just, if you submitted in that case, that would be a reason for your application to get tossed out if it needs to be submitted on the, by the school. So it also can help your grant if your school has to submit it to say that you have this community based organization that is going to help you execute it, that you've made community partners there to help you with it. So even just mentioning the relationship that you could be helpful depending on the grant. Super helpful. Um, even for, you know, when we do our grant, we always like to see that there are other community partners there. Um, it, it just, it helps to inspire confidence that like you are going to have the resources and the people and the technical experience that you need to complete whatever this thing is that you're, um, that you're doing. So, okay. I don't see that in here yet. So why don't well, we- I wanted, we can take a minute to go over the sponsorships. Let's do That's, it. Yes, we'll perfect. Just fly through this because it, it's not a grant, but if I'm guessing it's, all of you are here today because you're looking for funds. It's so another I, option. Yeah. <laughs> wanted to mention that you could always take a stab at it and try to ask for sponsorships from local or national businesses or organizations around you. Um, so next slide. Well, um, so a sponsorship is when a business or entity can support with funds or materials, and they do that in exchange for audience exposure. Um, and so why you might be interested in sponsorships is maybe you're, you don't qualify for grants. So like a lot of times the private schools don't qualify for grants, even though they could really use money for their projects. Um, you might have a school budget that's too large, so it's hard to show that you're in, in need of like certain supplies. Um, sometimes the grants, you need to be a 501c3, you need to have like a PTA that has that certification. Um, and so sometimes that can be a barrier for people getting grants. And then the other kind of biggest reason is maybe you just need money in a more immediate time frame. If you're looking to build like over the summer we were getting emails like what can I apply for we need to build an outdoor learning classroom by September like in a month because um, all of this has just sprung on everyone so suddenly but there's no grant that's going to have a turnaround that can give you funds that quickly but if you needed uh, like seating for an outdoor classroom 
you could try to call up a few or, or mulch for the classroom or garden. You could call up a few tree services that are in your vicinity or even Long Island. Sometimes people have had luck with that. Calling them up, seeing, explaining who you are, what your project is, what you're looking for, which is maybe tree logs that you can use for little seats and do a reading circle mulch in order to have your outdoor classroom. And would they be interested in supporting that project? Uh, the next slide. Laura, you check your phone. Let me take this slide. Okay. okay, so examples of what a sponsorship could look like. Like we've had some schools where um, they have reached out to like a local, a local neighborhood store who's maybe donated some pumpkins and then the school has sold those pumpkins as a fundraiser. Um, so that's popular. You know, you could go to like a local if you have a local place that's near your school that maybe does like bagels and coffee and they'll donate those for like a service day or um, when I was in high school, we had our, um, our soccer team used to raise money by getting bagels donated and then selling them to students the next day. So there's all kinds of like really creative ways to do this. Or maybe you reach out to a hardware store and they donate lumber and soil to you. Um, Fun little fact about hardware stores and big box stores is that they cannot sell uh, soil if the bag has been ripped. So I'm not saying go slash, but you can ask if any like bags are, are unsellable and then offer to take them for them. And that's some a way that like some of our schools have gotten um, donations of soil from big box stores or even from some local hardware stores. So these are examples, but you know, it, it looks a lot of different ways and you can get kind of creative with it depending on who's in your neighborhood. Um, let's see, how do you ask? I mean, sometimes asking, anytime you're doing fundraising, asking for money is sometimes the most awkward part. <laughs> um, so I hear you and I get that. It really helps if you're gonna do a sponsorship to ask a business that you know personally and is in your neighborhood. So maybe when you're on your way to school, there's a, a coffee place that you stop in every morning and you get your coffee from. That means they know you. Um, it helps if you can explain how it helps the entire community, not always just your school community. Um, if you can make the case for how it would help their business. So, you know, if they are, are donating uh, cups of coffee to like a garden build day. And then that means that their logo is all over that. Then that's great for their business too. Um, if you can give them an example of like the number of people who are going to like be exposed to their whatever, like, you know, we have a newsletter, it gets sent out to 3000 people in our school community, 200 people, whatever it is, you know, if you can give them those numbers or like 50 people will be at said event with their families, like something along those lines is helpful. But also like it helps to, they may ask you like, can I get a, a tax write off for donating? Usually no. Um, so it, it's helpful to be upfront with them about that. Um, and then other tips, you know, if you can give them some pictures from the, if they sponsor some kind of event and you can give them pictures so that they can publicize, that helps get the word out in the community about what you did at the school. Always, always, always send a thank you. Um, and anything you can think of to foster the relationship. If they help sponsor your school garden and that means that you bring them a bouquet after you've harvested the first batch of flowers that they can put on the counter by the register with a little sign that says, you know, these flowers were grown thanks to like your support. That's lovely. So just always those nice little touches um, could be super, super helpful. And these two grants, just a reminder, we want them to be on your radar. We have Thad here now. Thad's with the Office of Sustainability. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Thad so that you all can ask him some questions. You can throw them in the, in the Q&A for us, and we will ask them to Thad. Um, he has so much information about the grant. We really like to take this opportunity for you to get to know that on that, like know the funder level that we were talking a little bit about before. So um, we're going to make sure that you have all the information about the Office of Sustainability grant with like the, the details. Um, but yes, let's let's let you ask that your questions. Thanks, Kristen and Laura. Um, you set this up where it feels like it's speed dating now, but I'm <laughs> glad to be here. <laughs> um, I'm open to be of service to however I can. 
I did share some slides. I don't know if you've already given those out, Kristen. We did not, so we okay. can go through them if we want it. If we want, it's up to you. I want to be what's best used for this audience. So if you think there might be better use of my time to answer questions, we can do that. Okay, audience, let's ask you: okay. Do you want that to go through the slides about the sustainability grant, or do you want to ask him questions? So you can throw in the chat slides or questions. Kristen, you can go to the next slide too. It gives a very brief. It's part of his slides that gives a brief overview. Great. Oh yeah, that's the essential details. <laughs> All right, we've got two votes for both, three okay. votes for both. Let's do slides. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, um, this is Thad's email. So now someone before who was asking about contact information, you have it um, and let's do your slides. Sure. So uh, glad to be here. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Thad Copeland. I am uh, the Deputy Director of Sustainability for the Office of Sustainability. And uh, this is our fifth year offering this grant. We're very happy to be able to do it this year. We weren't sure we would be able to because of our, as everyone knows, the tough fiscal environment we're in. Um, but we are scaled back a bit, but we still have our garden and outdoor learning category, which I know is the biggest interest with this group here. So we'll focus on that. Um, am I allowed to go to the next slides or do one of you have to do it? I have to do it. So you okay. could just say next and go I'll ahead. get it for you. <laughs> okay. um, the big thing I want to just let everyone know here is the funding for this is derived from largely our demand response program, which means we have over 350 DOE buildings that are enrolled in our energy program. And so on days in the summer, especially when we have those heat waves of multiple days above 90, Degrees, the utilities call on our schools to cut our energy usage uh, in a prescribed way that doesn't impact the operation of the buildings but saves a lot of energy. And when we meet our targets for that, the utilities give us a kickback, a kickback or a rebate that we are able to again reinvest back into the school system. So all of our money from this pretty much comes from that program. So it's a great way that we're able to take energy conservation and reinvest that success back into the schools. Um, next slide. So we have this year these categories for our grant. Again, I know my audience here is the gardening group, so we'll focus on that. But if you're interested in the others, um, basically the top three bullets are you can request, or actually top four, you can request $5,000 um, in a budget for us as your proposal and get the money transferred. And then the last category, the recycling and waste materials, you can request those on an order form. We're not asking for money to buy those. We buy those through our school contracts and then we ship those items to your school that are on that request form. Um, and I want to really stress that bottom statement there about adaptability this year. We have no clue what is going to happen in a month or even next week. So um, when you're making a proposal for our office this year for this grant, we really want you to consider how things, how money might still be used if schools shut down again um, or how you can create it uh, with it. Thank you for saying that, Thad. We were stressing that earlier, and now it just makes us feel right. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> it's huge. So, All right. So these are some examples of things we funded in the past. Um, again, for time and because of the interest, I'll just focus on the garden and outdoor learning. But um, technical support, um, garden education. So that could be using the money to work with um, a third party, like a non another nonprofit or an organ a small organization to come in and do some programming and provide services. The one key factor here is whoever is doing those services must be a DOE vendor. It's the only way the school, because we're gonna give this money to the principal's budget and then the, the school budget person is gonna cut the purchase order. So they have to be a DOE vendor to do these services. Um, gardening and outdoor learning could also include things in the wellness realm like outdoor learning, physical education, uh, and then equipment and materials. That's a large part of what we do. I also want to stress the definition of garden. We don't really have one or it doesn't really mean soil out in a schoolyard. It could be hydroponics. It could be uh, seedlings in a windowsill. We're very flexible with what gardening could be. Okay, next slide. Um, we'll skip this for brevity, I, I think. Uh, the same here, but if you're interested in recycling materials, that's what you can ask for. Some baseline requirements. 
Um, we're not, unfortunately, able to uh, support any charters with funding, and it's only because of the way our budgets are set up at the DOE. We can't transfer money from our budget to charter school budgets. Um, the other thing is the, none of the money can be used to pay for any DOE personnel expenses. So if you're a DOE employee, you can't write us and say, I want this money for my own per session. We can't do that. Um, all funds have to be fully used by June 30th. Every application we receive must be complete. Um, that's very important. We also want a principal and custodial engineer sign off. That's just so we know there's been communication and coordination in the building with what you're asking to do. Um, the employee, the DOE employee must submit the application. It doesn't mean they have to fill out the application. We would prefer for that to happen. But if a student wants to work on some of the application or a parent, that's okay. But the DOE employee must actually submit it. Um, and the last thing is because we're the Office of Sustainability, we want to make sure that a sustainability coordinator has been designated um, for this year. And if you're not sure if you have one, you can uh, email me or in the application itself, we have a link to a spreadsheet where you can look up your school name and see who the coordinator is. Next slide. Some tips. Uh, probably you've already gone through these today, but I'll reiterate. Organize yourself is so important. Um, we've created the application where you can download the whole thing before you fill it out. It gives you a time to think about, gather your information, think about your responses. Highly recommend drafting them in a, a Word document and then cutting and paste. Um, again, it has to be complete. You will be disqualified if it's not. It's, last year we uh, received almost 350 applications and funded about 120, so it's pretty competitive. Um, once it's submitted, it's final. So again, double check, be methodical. Um, your budget, really, this is important. We want you to do as much homework on this now as possible. I know this is a hard part for a lot of schools because finding garden vendors is not easy, but figure out who in your school is your budget contact and become friends with them. They can help you look up vendors in FAMIS, which is the DOE procurement database. Um, and just a reminder that Amazon is not a DOE vendor. You can buy stuff from them that's under $250, but anything over 250 you cannot purchase from Amazon. Um, so those are my top tips. Next slide. Um, this is how we evaluate our grants. Everybody has their own criteria, as you know. Um, we want, again, to make sure they've been submitted by the DOE employee, that your school has a sustainability coordinator in place. They're complete. Only one application per school. I can't stress this enough. Um, <laughs> have this conversation, figure out who else is maybe working on this, ask your principal if they know of anyone else who's applied. You will get kicked out if we get multiple applications for a school. Um, we want to make sure that what you're proposing is feasible to be completed by June 30th, and that, again, it's flexible with uh, some adaptation built in. Um, additional criteria, um, if schools were funded by us last year, we're not in a position to be able to fund them this year. Um, we're also looking to make sure that we have an equitable distribution of our awards. So we're, it's really important that we're looking at how every borough is uh, participating in this. And then lastly, this is a new area for our office, but we're trying to do a lot of work within equity. And we're looking at the school's economic need index percentage to, cons to help us determine uh, schools. It doesn't mean that you'll be disqualified if you have a high or low score. We're just sort of taking that into our consideration. I have more information on that on the next slide. Um, again, if you've not heard of this, um, it's part of the DOE's demographic snapshot. That link will be, um, will this be shared? Is this PowerPoint? Yes. Great. Yes. So you can uh, visit this link and download it, but every school has been ranked uh, based on a variety of factors to determine their economic need. And the average score for the city is 71.9%. So, again, what your school's actual score is, is not going to disqualify anyone. It's just something that we're looking at to help us look at how we're distributing our um, resources. Next slide is the timeline. So, if you, so for the biggest state that's not on here is the deadline. The deadline to submit is uh, Tuesday, November 17th at 11.59 p.m. So once that happens, we'll go into our review process. And the week of January 4th is when we'll be announcing who our winners or our finalists are. Once that happens, 
uh, you can have a few weeks of celebrating until the money arrives and then the work begins. <laughs> um, February, probably early February, hopefully, um, you'll receive the funding transfer to your principal's budget called Galaxy. You'll get an email from me as well your principal letting you know that it is there. And then you, the hard work begins of working with your school to create the purchase orders, procuring the services or materials. And then just know that everything has to be used by June 30th. The one date I don't know, but is an important one, is there's a PO a purchase order deadline for schools. It's usually in mid-April, so anytime after mid-April, you really can't uh, cut a purchase order for anything, which is really important to know as well. And I think, oh, I have my specific parts of what we're looking for in the application. I don't know if I should go through these. There's two more slides, or if I should pause for questions. How are we doing on time? We are kind of at the end of end of time right now. Okay. We're planning to do this. Okay. Um, I don't. We haven't gotten any new questions though from the audience. Okay. So, so I'd say maybe just keep rolling and. All right. If you all have questions, throw them in that Q and A, and we will answer them. Yeah. Yeah. We'll stay a few more minutes. Yeah. So the next two slides are just what we're looking for in our application. Um, a purpose statement. We want you to briefly, succinctly give us your headline. What is this you're asking for and what will it do? It just helps us know immediately what we're looking for. Um, application plan and timeline. Again, everything we're asking for is that we want you to try to keep to this 200 words or less. Um, that's not a hard, hard number, but we don't want to read a novel, so please make it succinct and brief. Um, and we're also looking for uh, you, you to tell us how you're going to connect this back to your school. So we want to know that what we're funding isn't being used in isolation with just your classroom or only affect 10 students. Like, tell us how you're going to make this larger have impact within the school body. Um, the budget, we have a template you can download. It's nothing fancy. You can make your own in Excel. Uh, but we just really looking for seeing a plan of what you're buying, who the vendor is, how much these items cost, um, and then making sure it all adds up. Our cap on this is five thousand dollars, but don't ask for the don't ask for it all if you don't need it. Especially this year, we're trying to make our money go as far as we can. If you only need five hundred dollars to buy some soil and seeds, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't mean we won't consider it. Last year, we funded something that was a hundred dollars. So be realistic. Ask for what you need. Um, if you need the full thing, great. Also, in the budget narrative, explain how the items will be used. So sometimes we work with gardens that have big projects going on where they're getting money from multiple sources. Tell us that. It makes, helps us understand, okay, we understand what you're doing is a huge thing. You're going to get 5000 from us and 10000 from the city council member. Like, connect those dots for us so we understand. Um, and then and the last... If uh, I could just jump in yep. for one second. So that's the Office of Sustainability grant. They don't have a minimum. So you can ask for up to yep. the 5,000, but if you ask for something that costs a hundred bucks and that's all you need, then that's fine. But there are grants that do have a minimum, in which case it would not help you to ask for less than the minimum. They cannot fund it if it's under that. So make sure that you read those grant requirements carefully. And in this case, it's fine. In others, it may not be. So just a like tip for those of you that are new with writing grants. That's a really good distinction, thank you. Um, we would actually prefer it to not be the full amount. That way we can support more schools. So, but bottom line, we want to make sure whatever we are awarding is what you need. Um, and then the last one is the optional materials. So again, it's purely your discretion, but especially if you're doing a garden, maybe you want to send us a before and after photo or a drawing of what you want to do, or you have a letter of support from Kristen saying how great you are. So anything like that um, helps us to also Again, look at the complete picture. So it's optional. And that's it, folks. Sorry I ran that so fast. Um, again, <laughs> my contact info. Uh, happy to stick around as long as I need to tonight, or you can email me after the fact. Let's see. There's some questions coming in. So let's see what we've got here. A couple people were asking for a link in the Q&A or chat, but I'm not sure exactly which link. It's this uh, bit.ly is the link to the application. Is that what they're asking for? I think so, yeah. Either way, you'll have a link to the application. You will be emailed um, this whole entire presentation and that slides. So 
um, know that that's all going to end up in your inbox a little later tonight too. So you will have everything that we've talked about here and more. Um, we have a question about can co-locate it, like if there's a campus school, um, can they apply all together? We have three schools and we work well together, they say. Sure. So this actually happened last year, except the schools didn't communicate to each other um, that they were all doing it. So what we did was we were able to connect the dots that they were in the same building and we emailed them all. We were only able to uh, fund one of the proposals last year, but we let them know that it, because it was a garden in a common space, it was like in the breezeway or something. We wanted them to know that we we're funding it uh, and it was our expectation or hope that they would all work together for that project. So um, if you want to, that's our best approach is to do that rather than trying to stack the odds and ask for $15,000. We'd prefer if there was just one application that was more collaborative. Um, but if you want to talk to me more about that in an email, I'll be happy to go into it further. Dad, um, there's another question yeah. in here that's a good one. How can we check if our school's a, not a, a, a recipient from last year? Last year? The list, I don't know if it's published anymore. It was on our website, but if you want to, I see it's Shereen McDonald. If you want to email me directly after this, I can just do a quick check. Just send me um, your school's location code. That's pretty much all I need. Okay. And we have a question about where they can find the link or the template for the budget narrative. Um, okay, budget narrative is different than a budget. The, so. Yeah. Um, the budget is like something that you would create in Excel. A budget narrative is like a Word document that just explains anything that needs to be explained. Um, if you don't have to submit that, if, it, if a grant doesn't ask for it, then there's no need to, to do a narrative. But the template that that is um, Excel that you have, and where can they yeah. find it? It's really nothing fancy, but there's a link to it in the application itself. Okay. So yes, yeah, so follow that bit.ly link that's here and you're gonna be getting it later too. And then you'll be able to find that budget narrative. I'm sorry, that budget, not the narrative. I also in the application itself have a link to like a little mini crash course of uh, DOE vendors. Like not, it's not a list of vendors that doesn't exist unfortunately, but like the steps to buy something in the DOE. Um, you actually helped me with this last year, Kristen. So I cleaned that up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's quite um, the journey. The next question is, how can I find out if my school is in a high needs, like a field school? I think they mean like high needs zone. Um, okay, so there's the, there's the link that Thad just shared to the economic index. Yes. So you can look there. You can also look at one of the things that I think a lot of New York City specific grants are going to be using this year is the list that was put out of the 27 hardest hit neighborhoods by COVID-19. So that's another list that I think is gonna be an indicator field for this year. Um, that was put out, I don't know, around the end of summer maybe. We have that list. We can, we can distribute that out, Laura, if you, if you wanna add that to this. Sure. Yeah. Um, other ways, other indicators, Title I is something that's sometimes good to throw into a grant if your school is Title I. I know a lot of schools are considered Title I, so if you can specify like the level of Title I, title I that your school is, um, that you would, it was it focus and priority, right? Those are the two titles that they sometimes use with that. I believe that's um, correct, yeah. Yeah, so especially if your school is a focus or priority Title I school, that's good to indicate in your grant. Also, uh, the, if you're a community school, that's another yep. distinction. Indicates need. Yeah, and that's a that's a great question for the administrators at your school. Like they would have all of that information pretty handy, and it's quick stats that you can throw in to establish the need, and that helps for sure. Ah, great. Laura just put in the chat the um, neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID, so you could see if your school falls into one of those neighborhood distinctions. And that would be something that you could write in your grant as to why you are applying for it, why you need it how it will benefit your community. Yep. Okay, let's see. I think, yeah. I think we have answered all the questions. So you've got us here, we have a few more minutes. If there's any other burning pressing questions that you wanna ask, if not, you'll have 
you have Thad's contact info, you'll have Laura's and mine in the, the follow-up. Um, but is there more, Laura? Oh, as if they want to see our emails, I think it's on the next next slide. Okay, next slide or a couple slides. One more. Yep. One more. <laughs> there we go. There it is. <laughs> Mine is there. Laura's is there. You can always reach out to us with questions. Um, you'll have fads too. And I want to say, you know, thank you so much for tuning in today. I think it's great that you're here and you're learning and you're trying to raise this money for your school. As much as we painted like sort of a bleak picture in the beginning, I don't want you all to feel discouraged. You know, I want you all to know that um, it is competitive and you have to be competitive in these, but the point is this money is available and it has to go to somebody. So it really may as well be you. Um, so don't, you know, hold back from, from doing this. You know, we encourage you to go for it. So thank you for tuning in. Let us know if we can be helpful. Please send us your questions if you have more. And yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thad, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Good luck, everyone. Of course. Yes, good luck, everybody. Good Let back. us know. <laughs> All right. Going to end.